Hello, this is Mr. Craig, and I want to talk about salts today. Uh, we talked earlier in the year about strong salts. Today's a great opportunity to talk about weak salts. So we'll start off with sol solubility equilibrium and solubility product. Um, up to this point, again, we've talked about strong salts and um, strong acids, strong bases. And the thing to recall or remember about strong acids and strong bases is that they dissociate 100%. So the things that we're going to be talking about today are salts that do not dissociate 100%. And one way to know that you're looking at, say, a weak salt is that you have to know your solubility rules as we get closer and closer to the AP exam, uh, depending on um, where you're at in the class right now. Um, knowing the solubility rules is paramount to succeeding on the AP exam. So make sure that you know... Um, your solubility rules, and also realize or recognize that if you're looking at a weak salt, you know that you're looking at a weak salt because you'll have some K value. So we're going to talk about weak salts today, and weak salts are um, simply that. They do not dissociate 100%, um, and they're considered to be not soluble under the terms of the solubility rules. So let's see. I don't see anything that's really phenomenal there, so let's jump right into the example. And again, this is very, very similar to a past AP exam question, but again, it gets us back into um, working with ice charts, um, K values, equilibrium. And again, the first question on the free response uh, section of the AP exam will always be an equilibrium type question, and this type of question was question number one for 2010 at least on the A form. So let's look at the example. It says silver sulfate dissociates in water according to the equation below. And then it gives the balanced equation right here of the dissociation of that. And do recognize that we are looking at a weak salt because number one, solubility rules, but number two, we have a KSP value. Now the KSP uh, deals with the solubility product, but if you want to think of it as a salt product, I tell my students that, and that's okay. You can think about that as being a salt product. So um, it's going to be a weak salt. All right, so we want to write the expression. And again, reviewing how to write expressions, it's always products over reactants. So KSP is equal to the products. And again, here are our products. So we have our ion. We never include solids or liquids. So silver has a plus one charge. Since it has a coefficient of two, we want to square that. And also the other product in this case is sulfate. And it has a negative two charge and it has a coefficient of one. Now, we don't put the silver sulfate underneath here because again, that's a solid. How do we know it's a solid? Look at your um, the, oh, the phase designation there. So we're done with our uh, part A. Now, some of us might say, well, we're not quite complete yet until we actually put the value, and that's fine. If you put that on there, that's great. If you don't, hey, nobody's going to lose any sleep over that. But again, make sure that you're showing this part. Okay. All right, part B. Calculate the concentration in molarity, which is moles per liters, of silver ions in a saturated solution of silver sulfate. Now, again, we're looking for the maximum amount that will dissociate in whatever volume it is. So again, we have our balanced equation, which is given up above where we have silver sulfate. And some of it will dissociate. Oops, let me erase that. Let's see if I put the coefficient in there. So we have two silver ions, and we have a sulfate ion. So again, we're going to be looking at an ice chart. Now again, I like using ice charts uh, simply for organizational purposes. You'll never ever be graded on an ice chart, but again, it'll help keep you out of a lot of trouble. So since it doesn't say anything about how much we start with, zero. Also, realize that over here we have uh, solids, so we put dashes there. Never put zero for a, a solid or a liquid. A dash means nothing's going to change. Pure solids, pure liquids never change their concentration um, in an equilibrium reaction. So on the product side, these will increase 
by a factor of x depending on what coefficient they have. So for the silver it will be by 2x, for the uh, sulfate it will be by x. So we'll have our 2x and x. And again, this is for organizational purposes. So now we can go back and look at our uh, equilibrium expression here. Okay. So looking at the equilibrium expression, now we're going to plug 2x in to our expression there and x in for our sulfate. So again, our ASP is going to be 2x squared times x. And again, that's all equal to 1.2 times 10 to the negative 5. Okay. Which, if I take 2x squared, that's 4x squared times x is 4x cubed. Okay, we want to solve for x here. So x cubed, and I'll show it stepwise here, is 1.2 times 10 to the negative 5 divided by 4. So we're going to bring the 4 over which gives us 3.0 times 10 to the negative 6. Now again, you would want to use your calculator on this. And then to find x, actually let me see if I can get more room here. Uh, let's see if I can get some room here. Ah, we're fine. So we can calculate what x is by taking the cube root of our value here, times 10 to the negative 6. And let me type that in real quick. Um, and some calculators are kind of nice. My little Casio here is allowing me to do cube roots. 3, negative 6. So I get a x is equal to uh, 0 0.0144. Now that's molarity, and that's what x is equal to. Now, unfortunately, Silver is 2x. So when we look for the, I'm going to put it over here, silver, concentration of silver is equal to 2x. So 2 times 0 0.0144. And so silver is equal to 0 0.0288. And that's molarity. Okay, sorry about running out of room there. All right, let's look at part B. Calculate the maximum mass in grams of silver sulfate that can dissolve in 100 milliliters of water. So we calculated X as being 0 0.0144, and so we know that X, if I have one of these, I produce one of those, so we know our concentration. So we'll start off with 100 milliliters. And convert that to liters. Oops. Okay. I'm trying to keep this under 10 minutes so I can post this on YouTube. Uh, 0 0.0144 moles per liter. And then one mole of silver sulfate is equal to something here. Um, so whatever the molar mass of that is. Oh boy, I'm under a hurry. Got a minute and a half. So 2 times 107.87 plus 32.06 plus 4 times 16 is 311.8 grams. That's the molar mass of silver sulfate. Multiply that times 0 0.0144 times 0.1. So I can get a maximum of point four, we'll say four nine or four five, somewhere around that ballpark of grams of silver sulfate. Now that's not a whole lot that can dissociate, but again, it's um, a weak salt, so we wouldn't expect to be able to dissociate very much. I do want to talk about or discuss the common ion effect. Now we talked about this. Um, back when we were doing buffers, which was a while ago, and if you need to review that, I highly recommend it. Um, but when we talk about the common ion effect, and I'll let you read over that, but I'll briefly discuss the common ion effect here, and I'll give you a couple scenarios. In the last problem that we just worked out, we calculated that we could dissociate almost eh, about 
0.45 grams of silver sulfate in 100 milliliters of water. Here's my scenario types. Okay, let's say we take our beaker of water here and we're going to place the silver sulfate in there and we're actually placing in 0.449 grams of silver sulfate in the water that has nothing in it. In other words, we have pure water. Here's some things that we should recognize or be able to observe or at least be able to predict as we do these sort of things. If I place 0.449 grams of silver sulfate in pure water, what should I see in the beaker? In other words, once that goes into the beaker, what should I be witnessing? Or what should I observe from this? Well, once I place this into the solution, I should see all the crystals. As long as I weigh it out correctly and I have 100 mils of water and it's at 25 degrees, all those conditions are met, I should see this crystal totally dissociate 100%. And upon that, we, would, we have just made our solution saturated. So what that means is we have some silver ions and some sulfate ions floating around in the solution. And also that the solution is now saturated. And that's a huge term that we need to know. Or that's a really important term that we need to know. Saturated means that we cannot dissociate any more of the silver sulfate in that solution. So if I add, say, um, instead of the 0.449, I actually added a half a gram of silver sulfate in here. 0.449 grams of that would dissociate, and then I'd have about oh, 0 0.05 grams of silver sulfate crystals sitting on the bottom of the beaker, or at least moving around on the bottom of the beaker after I've stirred it all up. So you'll have some excess. In other words, what that means is there's no way that this solution, upon becoming saturated, will be able to dissociate any more of those silver sulfate ions. Again, it's a very weak salt, and once the solution's saturated, it, that solution will no longer allow any more of that to take place. Okay. Now, let me give you another scenario. Let's say, oops, let me erase this. Let's say that we have our saturated solution Okay. Let me erase. Okay. Let me erase. Um, and let's say that we're now going to place in here some sodium sulfate. Okay. In other words, I have my saturated solution of silver sulfate in my beaker here. Okay. And now I'm going to add some sodium sulfate in here. Now. Here's something that's really, really important. Now, let's say it's just saturated. It doesn't have any excess in there. Once I place that sodium sulfate into the water, in other words, we drop it into the water, what will the sodium sulfate do, or the crystal itself? Make sure you know your solubility rules. This crystal will dissociate 100% upon hitting the water here. All that sodium sulfate is going to break apart. But what I want us to be able to recognize is if we do this, what will we observe after it has dissociated? Well, hopefully you're going to start to see some crystals forming on the bottom. And these crystals will not be sodium sulfate. Here's my question. What will those crystals be made up of? And think about Le Chatelier. Okay? So again, here's our, here's our balanced equation. This pen will write. So I have my, oops, so I have my silver sulfate. Okay my silver sulfate and it broke down into silver and sulfate ions. Now, common ion effect. What ions are now in this solution? Okay, What ions, I'm going to ask you, are in this solution now? Well, we do have silver, we do have sulfate, and we also have some sodium ions in here now. But recall, before we placed any of this silver sulfate in the solution, this solution was saturated with silver sulfate. So the crystals that are forming down here, I am adding a common ion. I'm actually adding more sulfate ions. So if I'm adding more of a common ion to a solution that is, one, at equilibrium, and two, saturated, these crystals here are actually shifting. In other words, they're the formation of an addition of a common ion which means that the silver sulfate, since I'm adding sulfate ions, they are going to shift 
away from the addition. That's Le Chatelier. So what happens is, I, as I add more sulfate ions, because again, recall, our expression that we wrote earlier on here can only hold a certain amount of silver and a certain amount of sulfate to have this value here. If I have this at equilibrium and then I boost the amount or the concentration of the sulfate, we have exceeded this value here and it's going to cause the formation of a precipitate or it will shift toward the direction that will form solid particles to eliminate some of these ions in solution. So what's going to happen is the concentration of the silver ions will decrease. We'll lose some of these silver ions because of the increased amount of the sulfate. So as the sulfate ions are being introduced or introduced again into this solution, we're actually going to form some more silver sulfate. And then I have to ask you, well, what's the sodium doing in there? It is simply a spectator. It's doing nothing. So it, as spectator ions, spectators don't do anything. And besides, make sure you know your solubility rules, which state that sol or sodium will not react with anybody. Okay. There's another scenario. So let's get rid of that. Oops, I raced. Let's see, what's another scenario I can give you here? All right. One more. Let's say we've got our saturated solution. Okay. Draw this whole thing again. I got two and a half minutes, so I can talk about it. All right. Here's one more scenario. Oops. Come on, right. Please write. Okay. All right. We have our beaker. Okay. And we are saturated. And let's say that this volume right here is 100 milliliters. Okay. Up. Oh, come back, back. So we have 100 milliliters. And again, it's still saturated. What will happen to the concentration of the silver? to the silver sulfate or to the silver ions or whatever type of solution we have in here. Come on guys. Well let's just say the silver ions. Okay. If I allow this to be exposed to the atmosphere and the volume goes from 100 milliliters to 50 milliliters, what's going to happen to the concentration of the silver? Will it go up? Will it go up? Down? Or no change? Let's think about this. The solution is saturated. That means that solution can no longer hold any additional ions. So as this water evaporates, okay, goes from 100 mils to 50 mils, what should I witness within the beaker? Well, since it's a saturated solution at 100 mils, it's still going to be a saturated solution at 50 mils. So hopefully you said the concentration does not change. However, we should witness something taking place or recognize that something is forming in the bottom of our beaker, and that's a precipitate. The reason why is because that solution can only hold a certain amount of ions in solution, and once that water is evaporated out, that solution can no longer hold those ions. So we start to see the formation of a precipitate. Actually, silver sulfate will start to form or crystallize out. All right, let's look at example number one. It says magnesium hydroxide dissociates in water according to the equation shown below. And it's given here. Um, whoops, better get the review here. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah. All right, so it says write the equilibrium expression. Again, the expression is products over reactants. So our KSP, that's a little light. Let's make that darker. KSP is equal to the products over reactants, so we'll have our magnesium and we have hydroxide and since we have the coefficient 2 there we'll have a square, since it's coefficient 1 we'll have nothing there. And again that's all equal to 8.9 times 10 to the negative 12. So magnesium hydroxide is very insoluble, has a very very low KSP value. Alright, calculate the concentration. So again, um, let's form an ice chart, just as we did in the earlier example. And this example is very, very similar to the first set of videos for today. Okay. So again, building an ice chart, 
is simply for organizational purposes. It'll keep you out of a lot of trouble at times, uh, but you should never be graded on an ice chart. So, again, ICE, initial change and at equilibrium. We don't start off with anything. We increase by the coefficient x, depending on, so 1 here and 2 there. We'll finish there, 2x. So again, our KSP is equal to um, x to the 1 power, and then 2x squared. So again, that equals 2x squared is 4x squared. So now we have 4x cubed which is equal to a really small number, 8.9 times 10 to the negative 12. Okay. So we can solve for x again. Cube, let's divide that out by 4. And I don't have that one memorized, sorry about that. So 8.9 times by 4 is 2.225, and I don't want to round too much here. Come on, pen, don't let me down. And then I want to take the cube, define x. Let me take the cube root of that again. 2.25 times 10 to the negative 12. So I'll cube that. Alright, so I get 1.3, let's say 3, 1, and again that's times 10 to the negative 4. Okay, so that's our x value, and what are we looking for here? We are looking for the concentration of the magnesium ions, so magnesium equals x, so this does equal our magnesium concentration. Okay, not too bad, that was pretty straightforward. Alright, part C. And we're doing great on time here. Uh, calculate the maximum mass in grams of magnesium hydroxide dissolved in 500 milliliters of water. Again, even though we calculated for the concentration of magnesium, for every one magnesium ion, it is coming from one magnesium hydroxide molecule. So we can say that the concentration for the magnesium hydroxide is 1.31 times 10 to the negative 4 when it is saturated, or the maximum mass that we can dissolve in there. That's what that's talking about, to form a saturated solution. So, start off, if you know your volume and your molarity, always start with the volume, so 500 milliliters. Again, convert that into liters. Of course, multiply it times your molarity, which again is 1.31 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter and then one mole of magnesium hydroxide I know it's 50 something but I'm not 100% sure 24.3 plus 32 plus 2 times 1.008 so around 58.316 and you may notice if you're not used to my class, um, I don't round anything until the very end. And I think that's a good habit to get into. So let's take that value 1.31. I did kind of round on that one, sorry. So the maximum mass here that can be dissolved in this solution is 3. Point, we'll say 8.2 times 10 to the negative 3, and that is grams. So not a whole lot. I'm not sure if I could accurately measure that out, to be honest. I mean, I could get to the thousandth or to a milligram here, but I, I'm not sure if I can get that 8.2. But again, do realize that this is not a very good uh, substance or a very good thing to be making a solution for, since it doesn't dissociate very well. All right, part D, it says a 0.2 mole sample of solid magnesium nitrate is added to one liter of our saturated solution that we just created. Assuming no volume change, does the hydroxide ions increase, decrease, or remain the same? So again, here's what we have. We have our saturated solution of magnesium hydroxide. Um, so we have magnesium ions in solution, and we have our hydroxide ions in solution. And now we're going to add a solid here our magnesium nitrate. 
going to drop that in there. So we're adding magnesium nitrate. According to solubility rules, what's going to happen to this magnesium nitrate as soon as it hits the water? Perfect. It's going to dissociate 100% because all nitrates are soluble. So now we have in our solution nitrate ions, magnesium ions, and hydroxide ions. And again, since we are adding more magnesium, more magnesium ions to this solution that's already saturated, according to Le Chatelier, if we're adding more magnesium ions, oh, my pen's not working, more magnesium ions to my solution that's already saturated, the reaction is going to shift in the direction away from the addition. Okay, so it'll shift toward the formation of these crystals. Whoa, easy there. So what I should recognize is a precipitate starting to form below, or some crystals. Let's say crystals. I don't want to talk about a precipitate. So we're actually starting to form some crystals at the bottom of the container because I'm adding more magnesium to a system that's equal, at equilibrium. So based on that information, since magnesium hydroxide is composed of magnesium and hydroxide, um, my concentration for the hydroxide should go what? Should decrease. So my hydroxide concentration will decrease in this case. Uh, I think I have enough time to answer this last one. Um, from part D, after adding the 0.2 mole sample of the solid magnesium nitrate, which was added to the one liter saturated solution of magnesium hydroxide, assuming no volume change, does the nitrate ion increase, decrease, or remain the same? In other words, what this question is asking is, okay, true, we added some more magnesium uh, to our saturated solution, but what is the nitrate doing? Well, hopefully, again, you recall what your solubility rules state, and that all nitrates are soluble. So once we've introduced the nitrate ions in there, even though, yeah, it's getting a little crowded in there, the nitrate ions are not going to react with anybody. So therefore, once it's dissociated, and once we've established whatever that concentration is, the nitrate ions are going to remain the same. In other words, it will not react with anything that's in that solution, the water, the magnesium, or the hydroxide. So the nitrate ions, they're spectators. Spectators, what do they do? Well, if you go to a sporting event, yeah, they might scream and holler and yell, but they don't influence the game. Yeah, they think they do, but they don't. Um, so again, they're going to remain. So in a saturated solution of aluminum hydroxide, 25 degrees, the concentration of aluminum ions is 5.22 times 10 to the negative 9 molarity. The equilibrium constant expression for the dissolving of aluminum hydroxide is shown below. So we're given our, excuse me, our expression. And the question wants us to um, write the Ex or write the balanced equation here. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get my things back here. So write the equation. So from the balanced equation, you should be able to know how to write this based on this information right here. Those are your products, since there's nothing below it. Also, you're given this, which is what we're starting with, and it does not appear anywhere in our expression. So our equation, our balanced equation, should look like this. And honestly, Nobody in my class should miss this. I would hope nobody ever misses a question like this. Okay, now again, we have our three there, which tells us what our, our um, coefficient will be there. Okay, so there's your balanced equation. Again, we can always double check and make sure we have the same number of atoms on both sides. And I think we're good to go. Calculate the value of the KSP. For the aluminum hydroxide, again, um, in this case, we were given a value, our concentration there. So we have 5.22 is our aluminum concentration. So we know that the aluminum concentration is 5.22 times 10 to the negative 9. Okay. And probably not a bad idea to make an ice chart. Okay, so we have our aluminum hydroxide and let's see here. so again ice chart nothing there start off with zeros we increase by X we're increasing by 3x here and we finish up with X and 3x now I do realize that 
yes, this 5.22 does equal x. So we have that. Now this is one way, and again, this, there, there's many ways of solving for this problem. Probably one of the easier ways is to plug these x values into the expression. So we have our expression here. So let's plug those values in. So we have our KSP. Hope that keyboard's not showing up for you. I apologize if it is. So in the first part we have x. In the next part we have 3x. And again, that's cubed. Why? Because it says it's cubed in our expression. Now I know I've had some of my own students upset by the fact that, yeah, we uh, have to cube something that we already made 3x. Hey, that's the way it goes, guys. So, when I multiply this all together, 3x cubed, 3 cubed is 27. So x cubed times x is 27 to the fourth power. Now, this becomes very, very simple. If we say that this is what x is equal to, we could plug that in. So I'm going to go 27 times 5.22 times 10 to the negative 9 to the fourth power. And again, order of operation, we want to take the power of this before we multiply it times 27. Do not do 27 times this and then take the fourth power. That's very bad math. So let's go 5.22 exponent negative 9 and take that caret 4 and that gives me 7.42 times 10 to the negative 34 if you wish to do it that way and then multiply that times 27 so my KSP for this is 2.0 times 10 to the negative 32 really small okay all right and again this is just one way of doing it. I mean there's many ways you could actually plug in the 5.22 here and then do 3 times 5.22 and then square all that. I, I think this is a lot easier. I hate to say it, but and I'm always looking for quick and easy ways of doing things, but it's not the only way, guys. Recall, the most important thing you need to do on the AP exam, or even on tests and quizzes and homework, show your process. There is more than one way to solve any problem, okay? So just be sure that you're showing your steps, your units, all that good stuff here. All right, let's look at the next question, and we're in good shape here. In a saturated solution of chromium phosphate, or chromium 2-phosphate, uh, the concentration of the chromium, here we go, we got another one just like that last one, equilibrium constant uh, is given below here, so we got a really fun one here. Write the balanced equation, so again, chromium phosphate, oops, that should be a 2 there, and that should be a 3, sorry guys. And so that means we'll have three chromiums again. That's our hint to tell us how many we have. And I hope that thing is not there. Good night. And phosphate. I really hope that's not showing up. And put a two there. Okay. So there's your balanced equation. Boy, that's a really great spot for that. All right. So again, calculate your KSP so we can make our ice chart. that is showing up on your screen. I hope it's not. I hope you're like, what is he talking about? Okay, so three chromiums plus two plus two phosphates. Okay. So again, dash, 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 zero, zero, uh, plus three x plus two x. Okay. Again, more than one way to work this out. We we were told that chromium, which in this case is equal to 3x, is equal to 3.42, 3.42 times 10 to the negative 7. Now, again, I'm going to go do it, work out a little bit longer here. So I know 3x is equal to that, so I can figure out, I can figure out what x is equal to by doing 3.42 times 10 to the negative 7 divided by 3. Okay, and that will tell me what x is. And again, you don't have to do that. I know there's another way, probably even a simpler way, but I'll be consistent on these examples. Divide by 3, so that gives me 1.14 
times 10 to the negative 7. Okay. So there's my x. So now I can go and plug these into the expression. So our KSP is equal to 3x cubed times 2x squared, which is really fun because now we have 27x cubed times 4x squared. Oops, sorry, that goes inside, not outside. Okay, so 27 times 4 is 108. And then whenever we're multiplying exponents, we always add them. So there we have 108 to the fifth power, times x to the fifth power, sorry. So we have our, what x is equal to, and again, you don't have to do it this way, but this is one way, so KSP is 108 times 1.14 times 10 to the negative 7 to the fifth power. Again, order of operation, do this to the fifth power first, then multiply times 108. So I still have this in my calculator, which is nice, because I can do caret 5, and that gives me 1.92 times 10 to the negative 35, and then I'll multiply that by 108. So I get 208, oops, right, 208 times 10, what is that, to the negative 33. Again, really small value here. So again, I, I trust me, I know there's more than one way to work this out, and I cannot emphasize how much or how important it is to show all of your work and all of your steps in your process. And again, a grader will not know what you have done if you don't do it or you don't show it. So I'm going to get off my soapbox because I know you're all very good AP students and you will do that.